Great. And for our last talk today, we have Melissa Bather on using R to estimate animal population density. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, that means hello in Te Reo Māori, the native language of Aotearoa New Zealand, which is where I'm from. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm a Kiwi living in Vancouver. Um, I actually moved there six months ago exactly today. Um, I'm very far away from my university, the University of Auckland, which even though I had nothing to do with it, I'm very proud to say was where our programming was born. <laughs> I'm currently working on my master's in statistics there, and today I'll be sharing with you the fundamental concept behind my project, which is how we can use R to estimate animal population densities. Um, a lot of overlap with what um, Zach, Zach was talking about earlier. Um, I do have to stress that this is like a very brief introduction. Um, I won't be going into too much detail, and um, I encourage you to look into it on your own. Um, it's pretty crucial to conservation. Um, and also, I am still a student of this topic myself, so keep that in mind if you are planning on asking me any really difficult questions. <laughs> um, so as a child, when I would read statements like, there are 400,000 elephants left in the world, I assumed that biologists or ecologists would venture into the wild, um, Dora the Explorer style, <laughs> sorry. Um, and spend like a very long time just counting all the individual animals. Um, of course, it isn't practical um, to individually count hundreds of thousands of animals. Um, and animals aren't just going to stay still um, and stop moving around so that you can count them. Um, also, some animals are very uh, tiny or good at camouflaging, like we saw with the owls. Um, and it might not be easy to count them even if they were completely stationary. Um, also, some individual animals can't always be distinguished between one another, so we can't always be sure that we aren't double counting some animals. Uh, so how do we estimate animal population densities and how can we use R to help us with it? Uh, before we do that, we need to clarify what we actually mean by density. So we're gonna let N be a capital N be the total number of individuals of a particular species but this doesn't really mean much unless we define a region to go with it. So we use capital A to denote the area we are interested in. Um, then density is simply N divided by A. Um, also note, I'll be using the terms traps and detectors to denote the same thing throughout this presentation. Um, there are a few different estimation methods we can use, but today I'll be focusing on spatially explicit capture recapture or seeker. Um, if I don't run out of time, which I don't have much faith in, um, I will be touching a bit on acoustic spatial capture recapture or ASCR, um, which is what my project on my masters is specifically. Um, to illustrate how Seeker works, imagine there is a forest with, um, which is home to a particular type of magical butterfly. Um, we want to know how many of these butterflies live in this forest. So we set up some butterfly nets throughout the forest, wait for a period of time, and then see how many butterflies are captured in each net. We take the butterflies that we capture and we put little harmless stickers on their wings so that we can identify them individually. And um, we call this tagging. Then we release the butterflies um, back into the forest and let them mix with the rest of their population again. Then the following day, we repeat the process. So we set up our butterfly nets again, wait, and then see how many butterflies we capture again. This time, some of the butterflies we capture might have our little stickers on their wings, but some of them won't have stickers on their wings because we didn't capture them the first time around. Um, and probably there are some butterflies that haven't been captured on either of these occasions that we don't know about. So we record the butterflies that were already captured, add our little stickers to the butterflies that have been captured for the first time, and let them all go as before. Um, we decide to do this over say five days in this case, um, and eventually we end up with enough information that we can estimate how many butterflies are in our forest. Um, so of course, this is an R conference, so I better show you how our capture history data looks inside of R. So seeker capture histories are typically stored in binary matrices like this. Um, 
Each row of the matrix represents an individual animal that we've captured or detected, and each column represents one of our trapping occasions. In our butterfly example, the nets are considered the traps, and an occasion is any time we go out and set the traps. So a one indicates that the animal was trapped or detected, and a zero indicates that it wasn't. So for example, butterfly number one was only detected on the second and third times we put our nets out in the forest. And remember, we know that it was definitely butterfly one that we detected because we had put the sticker on its wings. Another way you can look at this is that the first time we set up our nets, the only butterflies we caught were butterfly number two and butterfly number six. Sometimes we might want to do this over a number of sessions, like we might want to repeat our whole process once every year or every season so that we can monitor the population over time. When we have multiple sessions, each session is typically has its own binary matrix. Um, and in some cases, we might also have one binary matrix per trap. We store all of this in a capture history uh, object in R. Um, so now I'll introduce you to the seeker package. Um, authored by the authors on screen. Um, I highly recommend you take a look at the package web pages to learn about it in greater depth. And in particular, I suggest you check out the third URL, which actually takes you to a shiny web interface, um, which lets you input your own captured data and actually will create seeker models for you. Um, the seeker package provides a number of sample data sets that you can put into R to play around with yourself. Um, which is great if you don't have your own data and you want to play around with it. Um, so you can use the code on screen to check out the available data sets and the output will look something like this. Today I'll show you some basic seeker models using the brush tail possum data. Um, I hear possums here are different to the possums we have in New Zealand. <laughs> Um, so just quickly a bit of background about this data. They come from a trapping study in Waipurere, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and the source is Landcare Research New Zealand. So 180 traps were set out each day for five days, and each trap could catch a maximum of one possum per day. Um, like many things that were introduced to New Zealand from Australia, the brush tail possum is considered a pest and an invasive species. Um, they're vectors of disease, damage our native vegetation and trees, and they're predators of native birds, eggs, and chicks. So controlling possum numbers is really a key part to New Zealand's conservation efforts. Um, the seeker documentation goes a bit more in depth about the data if you are interested in learning more about it. Um, there are three components of the possum data. Um, so the first one is possum CH, which contains the capture histories. Possum mask contains the mask coordinates of the survey region, and I'll talk about what that means shortly. And possum area contains coordinates of the boundaries of the study area. So if you look at possum CH, you'll find that for this study, each trap actually had its own binary matrix. So in this first trap, none of these animals on screen were caught on any occasion. But since we know of their existence, that means that these animals would have been caught by other traps on at least one occasion. Uh, we can use the summary function to view the capture history in a more readable format. And we see that it is indeed a capture history object. Um, we have 180 traps. The traps are about 20 meters apart on average. I don't know if you guys use the metric system, but <laughs> it's all I can think in. Um, and we've got the X and Y range um, for our survey area. More interestingly, we can see how many animals were caught in each trap on each occasion, which is denoted by lowercase n. In this case, our number of unique detections is the same as the number of animals caught, since once an animal is caught, the trap was unable to make further detections that day. Um, we also have the total number of traps that were deployed on each occasion and the number of detectors that were visited, which again is equivalent to the number of possums that we trapped just by the nature of the study design. Uh, so a mask is simply the region that is defined um, as the habitat of interest. So, and we divide it into many cells, which um, the coordinates can be found in um, possum mask. And as you may guess, the study area is, um, it's the boundaries of the study area. Um, so we'll start by visualizing what's going on um, using some code from the seeker documentation. Um, so first we'll plot our habitat, and it looks like this. 
um, then we'll plot our captures. Um, and we can see that the captures occurred in like five regions, and that's because the traps were placed in five groups of 36 traps around five squares. Um, we also get some information at the top about how many occasions, detections, and unique animals we detected in the study. Uh, we can use the traps function to extract information about the traps and then plot those too. And we can see that the possums were in fact caught in our traps and not in some other random points in the study region. Um, finally, we'll just add the survey region boundaries. Um, so visualizations are fun and helpful, but really we want to make some models so that we can actually make some inference. So using the seeker, oh gosh, the seeker.fit function um, with the capture history and the mask object, um, we'll start with a null model where all our parameters are treated as constants. Um, we've got these parameters here. Density is capital D. G0 and sigma, are, if I don't run out of time, I'll tell you what those mean in a minute. Um, <laughs> let's look at the summary. Ignore that. Um, so the first thing that we can see is that we have all our um, parameters are constants. They're just, they're not modeled with respect to any variables at the moment. Um, and we can see that there's a detection function component that says half normal. So the detection function models the probability of an animal being detected or trapped based on its distance from the detector. Uh, it's important because if we want to estimate density, then we need to have an idea of how probable it is that animals are being detected. So uh, do we have many animals that are good at evading detection or do we have only a few animals that happen to be trap happy? So there are many kinds of detection functions. Um, here we're using a half normal detection function. Um, let's get rid of that. That's what it looks like. Um, yeah, without getting too mathsy, this is what the half normal detection function looks like. Um, so it is quite literally like half of a normal function. <laughs> um, so our first parameter, G0, determines the y-intercept of this function. Um, so it's like the, the base probability. So when the animal is a distance of zero away from the detector, what is the probability of it being caught? Um, and you can see how the function changes with different values of G0. Um, sigma is the scale at which the probability of detection decreases at the, as the animal gets further away from the detector. So the smaller the value of sigma, the quicker the probability of detection decreases as the animal's distance to the detector increases. Um, modeling these parameters as constants means that we don't expect um, other covariates like weather or terrain to affect their values. Um, so the next part of this output, we have some coefficient estimates. The one that we really care about is the one in orange here, which is our density estimate. So according to this model, there are about 1.7 possums per hectare. Um, but we might want to add some covariates to the model. So here we're using the distance to shoreline because that could indeed affect density. Um, the other values, the other parameters here are just being treated as constants. Uh, do the summary. And, um, and this time, uh, this model reckons there's about 1.5 possums per hectare. Um, we can do the typical model comparison using a Kaiki information criterion. Um, and we can use the model average if we want to. Um, if we do use the model average, this is our estimate um, of possums per hectare, so about 2.4 possums per hectare. Um, these definitely are not the best models to make for this data. Um, I just wanted something quick to show you. Um, yeah, and briefly, acoustic capture recapture, which is what we heard about before with the owls. Sometimes we actually can't see the animals um, or capture them either. Um, like tiny frogs or huge whales or owls. Um, so what we can do is listen instead. So in this case, our traps or detectors are actually microphones or something to record audio with. Um, and we estimate cool density rather than animal density. Um, yeah, so there are two packages that I recommend for this. Um, both are authored by my supervisor, Ben Stevenson, um, ASCR and Acre, which is currently being developed and I'll be making a shiny web interface for that soon too. Um, and I have to give credit for Ben for encouraging me to be here, even though I was terrified. And um, <laughs> uh, my, uh, my old lecturer, James Russell, who um, basically gave me my first introduction to these topics. 
Um, yeah, Nyamihi, thank you.